good afternoon everyone welcome to the second part of the webinar series um, uh, today's session is a very interesting topic uh, given that the world is now coming out of uh, the corona virus pandemic and it is asia that is leading the world out of this uh, entire catastrophe that we've gone through uh, i think the last couple of months we've had massive disruption to global supply chain process uh, the mobility of people has been severely impacted uh, there's been absolutely no travel and therefore no global business at all and interestingly countries in asia such as japan and south korea have managed the entire process of the lockdown very well at their end japan had virtually no lockdown and south korea introduced something which is very novel called a contact tracking a tracking app now contact tracking is a very novel concept to most of us but given that we are based in asia where the smartphone usage is probably amongst the highest in the world uh, access to data user data access to location is very critical and as far as the governments are concerned they figured that the only way to deal with this crisis or come out of it is to enable mobility of people in order for governments to do that what they've decided to do is to make it mandatory in most countries to download what is called a contact tracking app which would collect user data demographic data and will be able to track people such that they will be able to control movement of people as well as trace people who are affected by the corona virus thereby allowing it now it's become mandatory in some countries and today's webinar will be dealing with the issues across all the asian jurisdictions that we are we have speakers from china we have speakers from india malaysia and singapore very quickly before we start i'd like to introduce today's speakers we have vejin from luming international china we have neha segal nilchandani from universal legal india we have dato samish jeevaratnam from jeeva partnership malaysia and we have rudy gunaratnam from alpha and omega law cooperation singapore all our firms are part of the legal network international which is a global network of international law firms based in 50 jurisdictions around the world and this webinar is being conducted in conjunction with the lni so moving very quickly to some of the questions we have today uh, the first question and we'll start with vejin is do you have a contact tracing app or system in your country uh, does it collect citizen data and is there a prescribed regulatory framework for this process vejin yes we do and uh, there are mainly two types of uh, apps we use one is introduced by the central governments and the other is uh, mainly introduced by various uh, municipal governments Uh, many countries uh, many cities use both like in beijing we use both uh, systems uh, they're very much the same um, but uh, at the moment uh, there are um, uh, not all the cities you ha can have the system which can uh, recognize each other's data but i think that will happen so just take uh, beijing as an example like i said we use uh, both the central uh, government recommended uh, uh, app and also beijing one Beijing one is the most popular one used by most people. Now Beijing one is called Beijing Health uh, Kit and that went live on March the 1st. Uh, so for people who want to use this app all they have to do is to use uh, uh we call them WeChat or Ali uh, Alipay to search for this mini program and uh, or use or scan the QR code to access to it. and um, which are is the most popular um instant uh, message messaging um app used in china and also by many other people in the world i'm sure in singapore malaysia and um uh singapore you see a lot of people using uh wechat i use that too so alipay alipay is the uh, online uh, payment platform and uh, almost everybody in china have a um, smartphone can have both systems or one system So if uh, you see first time you use the Beijing health uh, kit all you have to do is use uh, um uh your own uh say for example WeChat to find this uh, a mini program and enter your personal details and provide your name and your ID card or your uh, passport number and then you will do a facial recognition after you've done that you will get this uh um uh something called like uh something uh treat a uh, show on your uh, on your phone which is the your health status if the green you can get into the office building or a public transport or other public places if it's yellow or red then you can't uh, keep going to those places 
and the Beijing one is valid for 24 hours. So you can take a, snack, uh, a screenshot, you can show it to people when you try to get into the building, um, and then that's valid for the whole day. Uh, the um, Shanghai has something similar, but I think it's valid is only for uh, uh, 15 minutes or so. So you can't really use that. You can't really take a screenshot. Um, I think the next question is, do you have a, a legal framework for using the data? The answer is yes. And then we can talk about that a bit later. In India, under the Disaster Management Act, the government has introduced a surveillance application called the Aroge Setu to help for tracing users who might have come within the proximity of people who have tested positive for COVID-19. In order to formulate appropriate health responses for addressing the pandemic situation, the app collects data pertaining to individuals who are infected or persons who are at high risk of being infected or who have come in contact with infected individuals. This data includes demographic, contact, self-assessment and location data. Demographic data essentially means your name, mobile number, age, gender, profession, and travel history. Contact data, on the other hand, means the data about any other individual that you come in close proximity with, including the duration of the contact, the proximate distance between the individuals, and the geographic location at which the contact occurred. Self-assessment data is basically the responses provided by the individual to the self-assessment test administered within the mobile app, and lastly, the location data, which is the geographical position of an individual in latitude and longitude. In order to secure collection, protection, and sharing of personal data of individuals and its efficient use, the central government has just recently introduced the Arogya Setu Emergency Data Access and Knowledge Sharing Protocol. <clears throat> Uh, in Malaysia, uh, you have three main apps. It's called Garap Malaysia, uh, My Sajatra, and My Trace. Uh, these apps uh, were developed by the uh, government of Malaysia, um, and it's been monitored by the multimedia uh, ministry. Now, um, basically, the purpose of these apps is to trace individuals' uh, movement um, either interstate or in the state. Um, and there are many um, apps now uh, coming in uh, to be applicable in the state level. They are uh, the Garat Masra, My Trace, and uh, My Sajastra are mainly used at the federal uh, level. Uh, each state are also introducing their own uh, apps and uh, the application of uh, the QR code. Um, in terms of uh, whether or not uh, they are regulatory, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, regulation at the moment, but it is not clear um, um, as how the application is going to fall under, whether or not um, uh, under which act, which enforcement body, which ministry, uh, that probably I will address uh, further um, in, 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 your, um, in your questions. All right, in Singapore, we have uh, two apps. One is called Trace Together. And recently we, had, uh, we have another app called Safe Entry. All right, uh, these are all in, in essence, uh, what we call is preemptive uh, contact tracing uh, measures taken in order to expedite this problem of the COVID-19 right now. Otherwise, if you do a manual tracing, it's going to take a long time, which was initially what was going on in Singapore. So when you're talking about uh, trace together and safe entry. They were both developed by the Singapore Government uh, Technology Agency and it's managed by the Ministry of Health and the Information uh, uh, Department as well. So it is very much a government-based, uh, government control initiative, right? For the uh, trace together, anyway, in, in, in short, there is not mandatory. It's, a, it's something where citizens are encouraged and for Trace Together app, there hasn't been a, a very 
healthy response to it, strangely, we only have about one-fifth of the population right now who have actually uh, downloaded the Trace Together app. Although uh, the measures uh, and all this uh, information given by the government is encouraging, people are still not very sure on the issue of their privacy rights. So we have this problem now. The government is facing the same problem. So the issue now is whether do we make it mandatory. Anything that uh, is in the apps, uh, basically the issue of privacy, is still subject to the uh, what you call the Personal Data Protection Act. We we'll still go back. The, the The main issue will be one of consent. I think the issue uh, when you when you are gathering the information, using the information, how you use it, and how long you use it for, it is still under the provisions of the PDPA. In short the act itself. So we're pretty much clear on this. Uh, thankfully, the government is uh, quite clear, although more measures can be taken in that sense. So people are still very uh, cautious about it and they don't want to sign up. Although the Trace Together has got very much literature by the government agencies that your information is not revealed at all. It is only your handphone details which is encrypted. And you have a, a, a password to your phone, and, which is held by the Ministry of Health, in short. So it's pretty much the same, uh, safe. And uh, we're still wondering why uh, there's still not much takers on this. The other one is safe entry, which was introduced recently, where you do the QR code on your handphone and you enter your shopping centers, your retail shops. Uh, these are all encouraged, and they are now going to encourage that in offices as well. Uh, safe entry has, if you download the QR code, it, you fill up all the information, which includes your identification number, your name, handphone, and it will start there, right? It's very specific and very clear for the sole purpose of uh, this pandemic. That's all. Download this app. So uh, in India, we have um, a recent notification that makes it uh, puts the, the burden on employers to ensure that the employees are downloading the app. So, uh, in your respective jurisdictions, are employers required by law to ensure compliance of the contact tracing app download? Uh, and does the app serve as a passport for mobility in the sense that if someone needs to travel to the airport or to the railway station or needs to travel across cities or state boundaries, uh, is it mandatory to have the contact tracing app downloaded and uh, is there any restriction on movement because you don't have that, Beijing? Uh, it's not mandatory, uh, but if you want to go anywhere, you don't show the phone which recording your current state health status to people. You would be allowed to get into the public transport or office buildings so, and going to the airport. So in that sense, it is mandatory in effect. Uh, the question is whether employers are uh, having the obligation to ensure that the employees comply. Uh, there's nothing specific under Chinese law to say that um, the employees must do it. So it's up to the employee, but then if you can't, uh, um, if you don't use it, then you can't go anywhere. So that's again back to the same issue. Uh, whether it's acting as a passport, I think it's in fact, it's probably yes, because you can't travel if you don't have the details on your phone to show that your health enough to travel. So um, in that sense, it's probably a passport. But on the phone itself, like in Beijing, uh, it shows very limited information on your phone. You show your surname, not your full name, and a few digits of your uh, ID numbers. So it doesn't have the full information. So hopefully by doing that, you only provide very limited information to the person you need to show the uh, health uh, status to before you are allowed to uh, get into the building or take public transport. Very much like China, there is also no law per se here that makes it mandatory for every citizen of India to download the app. But the various government agencies have issued directives from time to time which restrict movement of individuals without necessarily having this app downloaded on their phone. For example, on the 29th of April, the Ministry of Home Affairs allowed movement of stranded persons and encouraged that all such persons should download the app so that they can be kept under watch with periodic health checkups. But then when they extended the lockdown for further two weeks on the 1st of May, they issued new guidelines based on risk profiling of districts into red, orange and green zones 
and under these guidelines passed a directive that the use of the app would be mandatory for all employees in both private and public sectors. In fact, like Mohit mentioned, the head of the respective organizations are not responsible for 100% coverage of this app amongst the employees. It also made it mandatory for the local authorities to ensure that there was 100% coverage of the app amongst residents of containment zones. And then on the 5th of May, when India decided to bring home its stranded Indian nationals back to the country, they required all passengers to download the app on their mobile devices. And then most recently on the 11th, the Ministry of Railways directed that the passengers would not be allowed to board the train if they did not have the app downloaded on their phones. So as you can see, initially the government encouraged the use of the app, but now with these various directives and orders made by its agencies, having the app on your mobile phone has become a prerequisite for having accessibility to public spaces. Um, in Malaysia, uh, probably a bit similar to India, um, at the first, the ministry was uh, encouraging uh, citizens to use uh, uh, the apps. Uh, now, uh, for interstate travel, um, uh, the, the country has actually uh, imposed a mandatory requirement that you must um, ha uh, have your information recorded in the uh, apps um, for you to be permitted to be uh, traveling uh, interstate. Um, um, in terms of um, employers, employers are not uh, uh, been given any directive uh, at this point of time uh, whether or not to impose any um, requirement uh, to use the apps on, uh, as far as the employees are concerned. Well, in Singapore, nothing is mandatory at this stage. Uh, but uh, in my view, one of the apps which is... Uh, basically going into shopping center, they call it a safe entry, seems to be uh, an unintended mandatory requirement because uh, without that app, you are not allowed to enter shopping malls or supermarkets, even some of the uh, barber shops, right? But having said that, even if you don't have the app, uh, you can actually provide your any identification which has got a barcode where like for example your driving license or your singapore registry uh, id card it has got a barcode where it, it, that's sufficient enough to get uh, to get entry in so if you ask me there isn't any serious uh, mandatory uh, requirement yet although employers are now there's advisory given employers that the employees should download the app uh, when things are back to normal as well, or when they uh, loosen up the restrictions, which is coming very soon at the end of the month, uh, with the with the whole they call it circuit breaker. So that's the position in Singapore right now. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, as we all know, data is the new oil, um, and citizens of all our countries across the world are extremely concerned and suspicious when the government indulges in a high level of data mining. So you have civil society, which has raised several issues on how data is being collected, how it's being stored, how it's being used, and how it's being preserved or destroyed. Um, are there any issues in your countries where um, has the government taken any measures to overcome privacy concerns uh, with respect to these contact tracing apps? Vision? Um I think there, there are. The uh, central government's uh, um, authorities and also authorities of Beijing or at local level have issued uh, a lot of um, notices, uh, guidelines and, and the standards on how those information, the personal information collected should be treated. Uh, just give you one example. I think this is one uh, um, notice, formal notice issued by the uh, authority at the central level uh, back in February. It says that um, <clears throat> uh, when you, uh, the information you collect, the personal information you collected, uh, really have to be treated seriously. The local government has to pay high attention to the personal uh, information collected. Um, only the authorities health authorities uh, authorized by law to collect information can use this information. Nobody else, authority-wise or individuals, can uh, use those uh, information without the consent of uh, the, uh, the, the person who's involved. 
um, even uh, the, the information collected in the name of the uh, epidemic, uh, epidemic uh, control or uh, uh, prevention of illness. Um, another thing is the government in the same act, it says that same notice says that um, the information uh, collected can only be used for this particular purpose, very limited, and uh, you can't use for others, uh, other um, uh, purposes. Um, it's also required the local authorities to take a, a responsibility to ensure that the information collected are, are properly protected and uh, they should uh, um, uh, take strict management and technical uh, measures to ensure that uh, the information collected are not um, uh, being stolen or revealed. Uh, all the information and personal data connected this way are stored on, uh, on the cloud of the various local governments. Um, uh, so uh, hopefully information are, are properly uh, are stored and managed. Uh, and also government make very clear that uh, if the uh, information is misappropriated, uh, the individuals or the entities can take uh, actions against those authorities uh, who collect information from them. That includes the public securities or police. When the app was first developed in early April, there were serious privacy concerns as it did not address very basic issues like why, whether the information would be stored on government or private servers. Also, the data collection agencies were allowed to share this data with other necessary and relevant persons without there being any guidelines or penalties for violation. But after a lot of protests, petitions, and uh, it, learning from what the world around is doing. India also brought about uh, the protocol issued on the 11th of May. And in line with this protocol, the privacy policy of the app has now been updated. It now confirms that the data collected would be stored securely on a server operated and managed by the government of India. This information stored on the server would be hashed with a unique digital ID, which would be used to identify the user and associate with the collected data. The data on the app is now securely stored and encrypted in transit as well as at rest. Personal information provided at the time of the registration is encrypted before being uploaded on the cloud, where it is stored in a secure encrypted server. The privacy policy further states that the information collected would not be used for any purpose other than specifically mentioned therein and would be deleted after 30 days from the mobile if not uploaded from the server. Lastly, the protocol now lays down the principles of sharing the data and the obligations of entities with whom the data is shared. Violation of any of these principles and obligations would attract penalties as per the Disaster Management Act. In Malaysia, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I think uh, after uh, many uh, citizens have actually voiced out uh, their concerns over the air, um, there, there's not much... Um, have been done by the government in terms of uh, uh, having introducing measures to uh, overcome the privacy concerns. Uh, but the only um, clear indication by the ministry, uh, particularly the Minister of Science, um, he has indicated that the uh, information in the app will be destroyed uh, uh, after 21 days. Um, he's also said that he'll be introducing a source code uh, in the usage of the app um, other than that, we do not have clear uh, regulations or policies or guidelines uh, in terms of uh, privacy use. So um, if we were to uh, draw an analogy, analogy of what uh, the provisions of the Personal Data Protection Act uh, and the app is concerned, I think uh, it is insufficient at the moment uh, because uh, the principles in the Personal Data Protection Act uh, particularly seven principles uh, of how uh, data is uh, stored is not been adhered to in the usage of the app in Malaysia. Uh, so there's lots to be done as far as the uh, measures uh, towards uh, uh, privacy uh, issues in using the app. In Singapore, I think uh, the way I look at it is twofold. One is the collection of the data and the second one is ensuring that it is stored uh, securely, All right? As far as the collection of data is concerned, uh, there, there is very sound advice, advisories given by the Personal Data Protection Commission. 
right? And this is addressed to all uh, organizations as to how you are going to collect uh, the data, how you're going to use the data, and then how you are going to uh, disclose it. When can you do it? It still falls back on the act itself. The main issue here is one of consent, right? And then what do you do after the purpose of collecting the data, right, no longer exists? So they're very clear about that. They're given advisories. They even give an advisory to all malls, retail shops, standard advisories before the public enters. So they very uh, they are perfectly made to understand that their privacy is protected. Right now. Under the PDPA as well, there are exemptions provided where you can organizations can collect data during emergencies. And this is considered, according to the commission, as an emergency where lives are involved, uh, the national interest is involved. So these exemptions are going to be used, have been used right, by the commission to tell organizations you can use, you can collect the information from their identity card as well. The government is now the second part is the issue of storage. It's all kept in there very securely, for example, in the MOH uh, right sites where it's very secure. Okay. While this has been done, this has been uh, the whole thing is one of trust. People are still not trusting the government uh, in, a, in a very big way because uh, number one is trust, number two is transparency. And in the recent past, Sadly, our public bodies uh, have been hacked. Uh, information has been taken out, which is uh, very unfortunate, right? But having said that, coincidentally, over the last one week, there is talk now on reviewing on a punishment for a breach of data right, protection and also to have a common saving of all data for public agencies. Uh, that's very interesting, uh, Rudy. I think... Uh uh, most people have concerns over the trust uh, factor in terms of how the government will use this data. Uh, and coming to the final question, uh, do you see this app as a violation of the citizens' rights to privacy? And in your respective jurisdictions, has there been any judicial intervention in this regard? Meiji. I think it's probably very much a, a balancing act. The data connected, uh, collected by the government is, is very important and necessary for the government to trace the relevant uh, cluster of the people in order to contain the epidemic. Um, uh, I think that the way the information is used, stored, secured, and especially how to enforce the confidentiality obligations uh, on the information collected is uh, is probably more uh, relevant in this context. It is a difficult question, uh, but probably for the common good, we, we have to do it. As far as the judicial intervention is concerned, I think it's, it's a bit too early to know uh, whether there's any cases. As far as I know, I don't, I haven't heard about anything at all. But I think if the information provided is not properly treated or, uh, or has been uh, wrongfully disclosed, then the person affected can take actions under the Chinese legal uh, framework. Like mentioned earlier, it is a balancing act, an act of balance between life and privacy. So both of which are very important fundamental rights. But uh, currently the need of the hour of this 21st century is to have a technology-based solution to an unprecedented problem of COVID-19 pandemic. But it is crucial that this necessity does not lead to a lasting change in how we approach privacy as a whole. By design, the app in India goes a step further than most such tools developed around the world as it tracks where the person has been instead of merely determining who they were in close contact with. This functionality, while on one hand, can theoretically help identify hotspots of virus, but at what cost of privacy? Various technology rights and civil society petitions have been filed with the Prime Minister's office protesting against the mandatory use of the app and expressing serious concerns about the violation of privacy through mandated use. By issuing the protocol on 11th of May, the government seeks to provide certain procedural guidelines and safeguards for the data collection activities. However, it does not illustrate how digital contact tracing through centralized mobile apps is the least privacy intruding method 
of exposure notification and disease management. So the protocol comes with a sunset clause of six months reviewed periodically. There is no legislative or judicial determination for its continuance beyond the initial period, thus skipping essential guarantees against potential abuse of such powers by the government. Further, there continues to be concern on the mandatory requirement of, the, of downloading the app, especially when so many of us do not have smartphones. In this regard, a petition has been filed in one of the state high courts against the central government, and the matter is currently sub judice. So we would need to wait to see how the government overcomes this hurdle. Um, in Malaysia, there's yet to be to have any judicial intervention uh, as far as the usage of the app is concerned. Uh, whether or not it, uh, uh, the app is in violation of uh, citizens' rights, um, uh, it is my opinion that I think um, there must be a lot of improvement in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, they must be having a, they, the government must introduce a privacy and data protection uh, framework. Uh, there must be clear uh, guidelines on how the uh, data is going to be handled. Uh, there must be consent from the users. Um, there must be also a conformity uh, between each state um, and the federal. Um, at this point of time, there is no clear policies on the conformity between us, uh, the introduction of the app in the state level and the federal government. Um, there is no clear indication of what kind of type of data has been collected. Uh, although, the, uh, as I said, the minister has indicated uh, that the uh, data will be um, stored and be disposed of within 21 days, uh, but uh, they must have uh, a clear, uh, again, uh, indication to the uh, data subject that the data stored has been um, uh, been disposed of uh, within the 21 days. Um, they must also have a complaint mechanism. Uh, we don't have a complaint mechanism on how the data has been stored, uh, whether it's not it's been abused, uh, whether or not uh, it has been used for other reasons, uh, there also must be a clear consent mechanism. So in Malaysia, I think um, uh, it is my opinion uh, that there are lots of work to be done. Um, but uh, at, at, unfortunately, at this point of time, nobody has challenged it in the court. Uh, therefore, there's no judicial intervention. Now, I'd just like to add on, uh, there's also uh, some case laws uh, uh, that has been uh, tested in the court of law in terms of privacy law, uh, but unfortunately the school of thoughts have been divided into two. But uh, the majority of the judges have said that inv invasion of uh, privacy is not an actionable uh, wrongdoing in Malaysia. So, uh, so there's there's lots of talk. Uh, talk. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of discussion to be done uh, at the uh, federal state, a uh, federal uh, level uh, on how. Uh, this uh, data has been uh, to be taken um, to to be stored well um, and, and and ensure that uh, privacy laws have been adhered to. In Singapore, uh, the question is very interesting. I will just focus on whether this app is uh, considered as a breach of individual rights. Now, Singapore is a socialist democratic society, right? The the, the basic tenet of that is not the individual rights that are important, but it is the society rights that are more collectively more important, right? Uh, this has been a practice uh, all along in Singapore. Society's rights are more important uh, than individual rights. So if you look at these apps, right, I think with good uh, regulatory framework, uh, good enforcement, transparency, that would build the trust of the people. We are still very much in that line, in my view, that we are very much in conformity with the act at this point in time. There's nothing to suggest otherwise. And this being a pandemic, uh, I think the, the, the nation and its people are more important than the individual rights. Uh, as long as there's no abuse by the government or any organization, everybody is very clear on this as to what the perimeters of this uh, collection of uh, information, data, and the use, and the period of its use. A lot of mechanisms are in place, uh, security measures are in place to ensure 
right? This information is not leaked out, the data is not uh, hacked or stolen. So at the end of the day, my view is, it's not an infringement of individual rights as far as Singapore is concerned. Uh, I think the society uh, is, the safety of the society is paramount. Yeah, thank you. I think you hit the nail on the head, Rudy. Safety of the society is paramount. And um, uh, given that we've been living in an unprecedented world, uh, moving forward and ensuring that business uh, restarts, that mobility is not hampered like it was for the last three or four months, uh, there is a fine balance between protection of individuals' liberty and use of data for the greater good. So uh, I have a question for all of you before any of the attendees ask one. Um, you know, COVID-19 has placed uh, health and human security on the center stage in the context of national security. Uh, in the event any of your countries considers implementing a national framework for collection of data of all citizens uh, in the interest of national security, what measures in your view should be considered in relation to protecting personal data? In Beijing, we'll start with you. The protection law. Uh, at this stage, we only have a draft which is out for the uh, public uh, to select the public um, uh, opinion. So hopefully at some stage that law can come out and I think that's probably a lot uh, the government can do. Um, I mean, there are other uh, regulations uh, talking generally about uh, protection of uh, uh, personal uh, data uh, c collection or um, protection, but I think uh, it's quite important to have the law at a national level to make sure that uh, we know uh, what uh, our rights will be protected. Another one from the uh, enforcement level, I think, you know, I mentioned we got a notice and also um, state, um, the, uh, the uh, um, local government level, there are a lot of uh, notices about what we need to do when we collect the, uh, the data. But uh, I think the enforcement is very important. How do we uh, make, how can we make sure that the data collection this way can be properly stored, used, and uh, not uh, uh, misappropriated? And I think that's probably a quite important issue. So it's a lot so the government can do. Thank you. Neha, your perspective? So currently, uh, we don't have a data protection law in place. It's a bill which is yet to be uh, made into a law. And for that purpose, I see that the government has put in place a protocol, which is an interim measure to take care of the privacy concerns and data protection concerns of uh, relating to the app. But I think from a larger, broader perspective, it's important that this bill is brought into place because I think it covers a lot of uh, issues that would be of national security concern, uh, largely because it just doesn't talk about the uh, collecting and processing of data, but also how it will deal with cross-border transfers. And uh, the it classifies data into uh, critical a sensitive data, which is, and the treatment of each is very different. Uh, it also talks about the right to be forgotten, which is something that is critical from a privacy law perspective. So uh, I think uh, the government should put in this uh, law into place as early as possible for the uh, national security interest of the country. I agree with you. Samish? Um, I think um, we have uh, repeated a uh, few important uh, issues. Um, I think uh, what the, any government, including Malaysian government, uh, we, it is important and paramount to ensure uh, the trust of the people uh, is gained uh, by using um, or sharing their personal data that we assure that personal data is uh, stored, uh, kept uh, well, uh, disposed of when it should. It should not. It should. It sh we should refrain um, any abuse. Uh, so there must be a protection mechanism to ensure that uh, all personal data uh, collected uh, from citizens of uh, at least uh, my country, Malaysia, uh, are, are protected. I think that is important. Uh, that that I feel uh, if there's any act. Um, uh, the government of Malaysia were to pass, I think they have to emphasize uh, the secrecy of uh, privacy issue on uh, collect collating uh, personal data. Thank you. 
Rudy? No, it has been extensively been used uh, and also enforcement has been uh, you know, on a very regular basis. Companies have been fined uh, for breach of Data Protection Act. Right Now, when you talk about a national security situation, for example, in the current uh, pandemic, uh, what is it that goes into the framework? Do you need a separate framework or do you just uh, add on to existing uh, legislation? That is a question I think I've got to leave it to the, the politicians to, to think about. But in my view, it would be easier to, to, to tap on existing legislation because we have a uh, effective Personal Data Protection Act at the moment. We could just add on national security and be very, very sure what we are doing in relation to the collection, use, and the disclosure of the data collected and the purpose of it. I think the perimeters will have to be very, very carefully defined and what sort of information are you gathering? Because purpose and the end of the purpose is something which is very, very subjective. Right? We don't know when this pandemic is going to end, do we? Right? So that is a concern to me if we have a framework separate. There are many national security issues, but with the current pandemic, I think it should be just be parked somewhere in the current legislation so that people understand, right? And the government has to be very transparent and they have to be absolutely clear how all the data collected is going to be stored, right? Uh, and how it's going to be used. That's it. Okay, thanks. Uh, can we have some quick closing comments from everyone? Uh, Beijing, we start with you. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's hard to say. I. I what I'm trying to say is uh, it is a very uh, challenging time. Uh, the uh, personal data uh, collection is probably something quite new to Chinese. I mean, in the past, we're so used to provide some information to people. We don't know how that information is used. So from both ends, it's important for the citizen to provide some information for the government so they can hopefully help to contain the uh, epidemic. On the other side, um, I hope that the government will do whatever is possible to make sure that the um, information collected this way will be properly uh, collected, stored, and uh, disposed of at the right time. Neha? Yeah. So after a lot of criticism from the data protection activists, the government has now relaxed the mandate to use of the app for employees at workplaces. But it continues to be a requirement for accessing public transport in the country. Thus, in my view, the app continues to be a necessity for the public at large to function smoothly during these times. But then again, these are extraordinary circumstances where right to life should triumph, like right to privacy. And in my opinion, the right uh, to privacy can only be protected. In my opinion, the app is a good tool to track and trace the spread of the virus in the country. But I think what uh, uh, can be done is that the government can probably make this software an open source software so that uh, all vulnerabilities and hacking, potential hacking can be avoided by removing the bugs that could uh, lead to other issues. Samish? Um, I think... Uh... This is a new norm. Uh, collation of uh, personal data um, at the government level, um, at the retail level, um, for instance, in working in malls and uh, restaurants. Uh, I think it's uh, important for us to share our personal data. There must be certain amount of assurance by your authority that they manage uh, the uh, personal data for, for that specific reason. Uh, they have to refrain. Uh, or to ensure that uh, the uh, personal data has not been abused, uh, used by the wrong parties. So there must be a uh, good protection mechanism uh, to ensure that the personal data yes. can, uh, collected from the citizens are uh, kept and stored uh, in a safe uh, manner. So uh, in, in, in totality, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a new norm and it's necessary uh, for governments to collect uh, personal data. And final comments from Rudy, please. Okay. Uh, my personal view is, well, the 
transparency and trust are all relevant and crucial. Uh, what is equally important is whether if you have a, an emergency of this nature, are we going to also give powers to the government to make it mandatory? Uh, you can have everything set up in a framework, but if you don't make it mandatory or you don't give them the powers, a discretion to decide how to exercise the discretion to make it mandatory or otherwise, then this would be a, a futile uh, exercise at the end of the day. All right, so I think this, this, this is a very crucial thing as far as uh, I'm concerned, is whether the government will be given the powers to, to make it mandatory for, for data to be collected purely for the purpose of the emergency. That's all. Thank you. Some great insights and perspectives from uh, all our regions. Uh, so thank you, Beijing. Thank you, Neha, Samish, and Rudy. Uh, thanks for sharing your perspectives. And thank you to all the attendees today. Um, we will be sharing this um, webinar on YouTube and on our respective uh, websites. So it will be available for you after this as well. Thank you very much.